carp are the villains of North America's aquatic ecosystems. They are masters of invasion, they are tough, and they are adaptable. Biologically, carp are remarkably impressive fish. They reproduce exceptionally well, tolerate and thrive in extreme conditions, they outcompete other fish, and they can survive almost anything. It's almost like they've been engineered to take over ecosystems and destroy habitats. Common carp grow large, often over 40 pounds, and they can live for decades. They are typically golden brown in color with large scales, a blunt snout, and two small barbels at the corners of the mouth. They have a long dorsal fin and a deep body. Like many of their relatives, they have a serrated blunt tipped spine at the front of the dorsal fin and also on the anal fin. The common carp is native to temperate Europe and Asia especially around the Caspian and Black Seas. It now has invasive ranges on every continent except Antarctica, and an especially problematic invasive range in North America. The common carp was first brought to North America in the 1800s as a food fish. By the 1870s, the U.S. Fish Commission and state agencies were widely stocking carp for food and also for sport, releasing them directly into streams and lakes via railroad tank cars, distributing them far and wide. As a result, carp spread rapidly and are now in every single continental U.S. state, as well as all of Mexico and southern Canada. Common carp are omnivorous bottom feeders. They root in sediments while feeding, which stirs up mud, uproots aquatic plants, and increases water turbidity. This destroys underwater vegetation and degrades habitat for native fish and waterfowl. Carp have also been known to consume the eggs of native fish such as sturgeon and suckers. Because they tolerate poor water quality, wide temperatures, and pollution, they just thrive in many habitats. Over time, they've shifted from being a prized food fish to one of the most notorious nuisance species in North America. The behavior and lifestyle of the common carp has a cascading effect throughout many factors of the ecosystem. I currently work for the Division of Wildlife Resources in the state of Utah, and the majority of my current work takes place on Utah Lake, a lake notoriously infested with the common carp. When carp were introduced to the lake as a food source, they did what carp do best and reproduced rapidly and began rooting up the vegetation throughout the lake. The lack of vegetation made not only decreased food and habitat for young fish, but it made this already shallow lake even more susceptible to murky waters. Windy conditions now easily stir up sediment and these shallow waters then become even warmer as the suspended particles in the water absorb sunlight. As a result, this has led to increased harmful algae blooms and other suboptimal conditions for native fish. This chain reaction of events is a common example of some of the harmful effects of the common carp, and a straightforward example of why this fish is considered a nuisance here in North America. As you may have guessed from the name, this carp is the most common and widespread of all the carp species listed in this video. The mere carp is a variety of common carp that is easily recognized by its patchy and irregular scale pattern. Despite its unique look, this isn't a separate species but rather a genetic mutation that is hereditary among common carp. The leather carp is a common carp without any scales at all, and the idea is the same. Koi are a domestically and highly ornamental variety of the common carp, selectively bred in Japan for their bright colors and patterns. Unlike their wild cousins, koi are most often found in garden ponds and ornamental settings, but they have occasionally been released or escaped out into natural waters of North America, becoming invasive. In the wild, koi typically lose much of their vivid coloration over time, reverting to a more muted bronze or gray similar to the wild common carp. Physically, they share the same body shape and features, such as barbells on the corner of the mouth, but they can be distinguished by their patchy red, orange, yellow, black, or white patterns. And koi, as you may have seen, sometimes have those really long ornamental fins. While not as widely established as other carp, koi can survive in many freshwater habitats, and they behave ecologically the same as the common carp, uprooting plants, stirring up sediments, and causing problems. Their presence in the wild is usually linked to intentional releases by their owners, which contributes to the broader carp invasion problem. 
The goldfish is a largely domestic form of the Asian carp. Brought to North America hundreds of years ago, it was one of the first ornamental fishes brought to the continent. Over the years, many were released or escaped from ponds and aquariums, and by the late 1800s, goldfish were widely established in the wild. Today they are widespread in nearly every U.S. state and Canadian province, though they aren't found in such densities as the common carp. The native range of the goldfish is primarily in eastern China and the Korean Peninsula. Goldfish are smaller than the common carp, typically under 15 inches long. While ornamental varieties are bright orange, white, gold, or silver, wild goldfish often revert to a dull brown or olive color. They can be distinguished from the common carp by their lack of barbels on the mouth. Goldfish feed by sifting through sediments for plankton, insects, plants, and detritus. This foraging behavior clouds the water and uproots vegetation, just like the common carp. This fish also reproduces prolifically, sometimes forming dense populations that compete with native fish and even prey on fish eggs. They are highly adaptable, able to survive in low oxygen and wide temperature ranges, which makes them persistent invaders. I have seen the damage caused by this fish firsthand as about a decade ago, someone released them into a mountain lake near my home. Over the past few years, the water conditions of this clear mountain lake became worse and worse, and today the visibility is near zero. In 2018, efforts were taken to treat this lake with rotenone and eradicate the goldfish from the lake. However, this proved to be ineffective as the goldfish seemed to tolerate the treatment better than anyone would have thought. In the end, the lake unfortunately still remains full of goldfish. The takeaway being, releasing pet goldfish does not go without consequence, and is in fact a serious problem all over the country. If you feel the need to dispose of a goldfish, the best thing you can do is euthanize the fish or possibly donate it to a local pet store. The Crucian carp is native to much of Europe from Great Britain eastward into Russia. Crucian carp were historically valued in Europe as a hardy food fish and also a sport fish. Their introduction to North America is not very well documented, but they are occasionally found sparsely throughout the U.S. and Canada, probably as a result of accidental releases tied to the aquarium trade or contamination of other carp shipments. Similar to the goldfish, it never developed barbels. Crucians are small-sized, usually under 12 inches, with a deep, laterally compressed body and rounded fins. Their coloration ranges from golden brown to bronze. They can be distinguished from goldfish by a straighter dorsal fin and a more uniform metallic color without ornamental variations. One of the Crucian carp's most fascinating traits is its tolerance for low oxygen conditions. In the winter, they can survive under the ice in ponds with virtually no oxygen by switching to an anaerobic metabolism, something very few vertebrates can do. Ecologically, crucians compete with native sunfish, minnows, and other small fish. In higher densities, they can stir up sediments while foraging, though less destructively than the common carp. While not as notorious as the other introduced carp, their ability to adapt to small ponds and backwaters makes them a potential concern where they have become established. Prussian carp are closely related to goldfish and crucian carp, being native to Eurasia. They have a similar native range to the Crucian carp, but extend even further east all the way to China. They were only recently discovered in North America, with established populations now confirmed in western Canada. Their introduction was likely accidental, probably as contaminants in shipments of other fish, or maybe from aquarium releases. Prussian carp are usually more silvery than the Crucian carp or goldfish, but they also lack barbels. They aren't usually quite as tall-bodied as the Crucian carp and grow to be around 14 inches long, making them a little bit bigger. One unusual trait is their ability to reproduce clonally. Females can use sperm from related species to trigger egg development, but the offspring are clones of the mother. This adaptation allows for rapid population expansion. Like all of their cousins, their sediment-disturbing foraging increases turbidity and reduces vegetation. They compete strongly with native fish and can quickly dominate ecosystems. Their fast reproduction and tolerance of poor water quality make them a serious invasive risk. Grass carp or white ammer are native to the rivers of Eastern Asia. They were first brought into the U.S. in the 1960s to control aquatic weeds. Stocked into ponds and canals, 
many escaped into connected rivers during floods, and by the 1970s they were established in the wild. Today they are scattered across most of the continental U.S. Grass carp have a long torpedo-shaped body with large dark-edged scales. They are olive brown to silver, they lack barbels, and they can reach over 4 feet long. As strict herbivores, grass carp consume enormous amounts of aquatic vegetation. While this can help control weeds in managed settings, wild populations can completely eliminate plant beds in lakes and rivers. This loss of vegetation reduces habitat for fish and invertebrates, it increases algal blooms, and disrupts food webs. Their impact on the ecosystem is among the most dramatic of any introduced fish. Black carp, also native to East Asia, are mollusk specialists. They were first brought to the U.S. in the 1970s, accidentally included with shipments of grass carp. Later, they were intentionally stocked into aquaculture ponds to control snails that carry parasites. However, floods and escapes released them into rivers, particularly the Mississippi system. Black carp resemble grass carp, but are darker with a pointed snout, and they can grow a massive 5 feet long, though the vast majority are more like 2 or 3 feet. Their defining feature is molar-like teeth, used to crush the shells of snails and mussels. Their diet makes them especially concerning in North America, which is home to many threatened native mussels and snails. Even a small population of black carp could devastate mussel beds and restructure bottom-dwelling communities. Because mussels filter water and support many other species, their loss would have far-reaching effects. Silver carp are native to large rivers in China and Eastern Asia. They were introduced into the southern U.S. in the 1970s for algae control in aquaculture ponds and sewage lagoons. Many escaped into the Mississippi River system, where they are now abundant and spreading towards the Great Lakes. Silver carp have deep, silvery bodies with small scales and a scaleless head, and they have a large, upturned mouth. Their eyes sit very low and forward on the head. They grow to be around 3 feet long and are known for their spectacular leaping behavior. Fish startled by boats can jump 10 feet out of the water, sometimes striking and causing injury to boaters. Silver carp filter feed on plankton, directly competing with native fish. Their massive populations consume large amounts of plankton, leaving little for species such as paddlefish, shad, and many larval fishes. This competition makes them one of the most ecologically disruptive invaders to North America, particularly the Mississippi River system. Bighead carp are a close relative to the silver carp, also native to the same areas in China and Eastern Asia. They were also introduced to the U.S. in the 1970s for aquaculture, and similarly they escaped into the Mississippi River Basin and are now widespread in the Midwest. They resemble the silver carp but have an even larger head, and the eyes are positioned even lower on the head. This picture shows how you can still see the eyes when looking at the bottom of the fish's head. Big head carp are even bigger than silver carp as they grow to be over 4 feet long and weigh more than 80 pounds. Unlike the silver carp, they usually do not leap out of the water. These fish also feed almost continuously on plankton, so they pose a similar problem to the ecosystem as the silver carp do. From the golden ornamental goldfish to the giant plankton-eating big head carp, these species have transformed many North American waters. Each was brought with human intentions, whether for food, weed control, or decoration, and their impacts have been far greater than ever anticipated. Together they serve as a cautionary tale of how introducing even a few fish can permanently reshape ecosystems. I encourage you to do what you can to help prevent the numbers of carp from increasing in North American waters. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe and check out my other species videos. If you watch this one all the way through, I'm sure you'll like the others. Thanks, and I hope to see you on the next one.